Today we're hoping to observe the Little Dumbbell Nebula, that's uh, M76, with the 0.5 metre here on La Palma. It's the first time we've looked at anything more than just a star with this telescope, and it's difficult to orientate sometimes because the field of view is very small, it's only a few arc minutes. First of all, I need to uh, check the exact coordinates for M76 and tell the telescope where to point, basically. Obviously, everything in the sky changes throughout the night as the sky rotates, but these coordinates relative to the rest of the sky are always the same. It's kind of like the address of the object, if you like. And I made a mistake, so I'm having to try again. Normally, I talk about the nebula themselves, but here I thought I might focus on the actual central star. And of course, it's the central star that's the thing that's very hot and is basically illuminating the gas around it. Of the thousands of planetary nebulae in the Milky Way, this is quite a rare one. There's only maybe around 40 of this particular type of planetary nebula ionizing star. If you think about the kind of gases that there are in the universe, the main elements are hydrogen followed by helium and carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. 98% of the sun is hydrogen and helium. And so even when you get to the final stages of stars like the sun that produce this brief planetary nebula, and then they kind of fade away as a white dwarf. Most white dwarfs are made of carbon and oxygen in the center, but with a little thin layer of hydrogen at the surface. But a small fraction of these white dwarfs have helium at the surface with no hydrogen. An even rarer subset of these things have kind of carbon-rich white dwarfs. And we think that the central star, which is powering this little dum-dum nebula, is one of these things which has got an unusual chemistry, which will then end up leading to an unusual white dwarf. So here we are. We've started the 60-second exposure in the visible wavelength. And when it's done, it will pop up on this screen. Here we are. And in fact, there's something here. That's very good. That's very reassuring. Well done. Yeah. So I think what we'll do now is we'll increase the exposure time to try and find the right balance between the brightness of this planetary nebula and the other objects. It's important not to overexpose such that these stars become saturated because then the photons that are received by the CCD for this star will bleed across the CCD and destroy the image. I'm going to go crazy in, say, 300 seconds, so five minutes. Turns out most of astronomy is just watching things tick by. So here we have a diagram which kind of shows how hot stars are, and it goes from right to left, going from cool to hot. And then we have faint things down the bottom and bright things at the top. This line here is what we think the path that most stars, like the Sun, will go through. So it starts over here, spends most of its time there, and it kind of goes up, becomes a big giant, kind of bloats up towards the end of its life, a bit like Marlon Brando did, and then it goes off goes across, it loses all that hydrogen envelope, but leaves behind this kind of little remnant that then illuminates the planetary nebula, which is this region here, and then fades away as a white dwarf. But the thing that we think is in the center of the little Dumbo nebula, M76, we think it kind of did its normal thing, went across here, but then did something a bit unusual. It basically it kind of thought, that was a fun journey going along here, I'm going to do it again. So it went down, and then back and wrong, and then did an extra circuit. It's what we call a late helium flash. A helium flash means it burns the helium to carbon, and so it becomes carbon-rich. And it's got no hydrogen left because it's already lost the hydrogen. And so a small number of planetary nebulae, which are things in this part of the diagram, they're hot enough to ionize the gas around them, and still quite bright, with a surface temperature of over 100,000 degrees, but with this weird chemistry. So our five-minute exposure is just finished. As you can see, the longer you expose for, you get more background noise from the sky and also the size of the stellar profiles of the other stars is blurred. And here we see the nebula and it's starting to look quite bright now. This is what astronomers call 10th magnitude. The human eye at best can see sort of six, six or seven magnitudes. And the magnitude, magnitude scale is the opposite way around to what people imagine. So the higher the magnitude, 10, 11, 12, the fainter the object. Only a really nice telescope can really pick this one out. I think it's one of the faintest on the messier object lists. It's roughly two and a half thousand light years away, I think. The planetary nebula we see, they're all very different from each other. So it's not like one size fits all. They all look very different. And so there's been suggestions in recent years that maybe normal stars might circumvent that phase. And it may be only a subset of, of low mass stars like the Sun that produce a planetary nebula because of some unusual properties. This one may be unusual in two respects. Maybe unusual producing a planetary nebula and having this unusual surface chemistry. So this little dumbbell could be a real freak of nature. Yeah, I mean, there are objects like it which don't even have planetary nebula around it. You know, maybe they're just a bit older, and so they've, uh, they've uh, it's kind of fizzled away, as it were. 
whereas this one is just at the right age. It's got this beautiful kind of bipolar nebula around it, and it's got this very unusual characteristics in terms of its surface chemistry. All right, Liam, so I've seen you make that, and I'm pretty impressed. Give me the lowdown, though. Well, yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, I'm impressed as well. I think um, for the amount of time we spent on this, only 10 minutes or so, we've managed to get an image where we can clearly see that it's not just a normal star. There's definitely something more to it than that, um, and that's exciting. There's definitely an extended shape with a squeezing in the middle, perhaps. I would probably call it a dog bone more than a dumbbell, but... Oh, a dog bone, then? Yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs>